Buenos días. Eh, um, uh, well, it's a pleasure for me to be here today. It's uh, an honor to to participate in, uh, in this course organized by the Universidad Menéndez Pelayo, and uh, it is uh, also a pleasure to have been invited by uh, the two coordinators, Elena and uh, Akova, to whom I really thank. And uh, it is uh, even a pleasure, or more a pleasure, because of the place where we are going to be today, I mean, because of the group of people that have been told that you participate a lot, and you interact a lot, and you work a lot, you have fun, and you enjoy, and so it's uh, the perfect group to, to teach and to spend a couple of hours. It is two hours, which is a lot. Uh, for me, you're going to be there sitting, doing thinking, and, uh, and that's it. And then we will finish and we will say, what? Something new or maybe changed in our mind. And that's one of the reasons of the title of this uh, presentation. Uh, care and love. I mean, when you introduce a presentation like this, I mean, Marisa asked me why care and love. It's, uh, it seems more like a song, more than a title for a presentation in a course. And uh, care and love because, uh, I mean, it is the acronym for CLIL. Also, it's a different acronym for, for CLIL. Instead of content and language, integrated learning that we all know and that we all say, I don't know how many times, we're going to find something different. Made of Basic words. These basic words are four, and these four have those numbers there. Do you know the, the numbers? What, what do you think the numbers are? What do you think the numbers could mean? No? What is the times that you, if you Google the words, you find in Google those words that number of times? And then we see that, for example, we find care, which appears four million times, which is not bad. And then love. Seven million, which is not really that much. I mean, if you Google drugs or sex, it will appear many more. Integrate only, 156. And then we have learners with 98 million, which is a lot. So something fails there. I mean, I think that uh, if we are going to work with learners and we are interested in what happens in our classrooms, we Google learners, learning, and all these things. Or if we want to find any good music, it's of uh, care and love and all these things, we will find these words that amount of times. But integrate is not a thing that people Google. And maybe what we have to do is to think that we're going to teach people who sometimes need to be integrated. They will not tell you. They will not tell you that they need to be integrated. And especially when we come with difficult situations. For example, this of using our English when we teach, which is what makes things a bit harder for them. So what we're going to do today is to try to, uh, let me see if this works, yeah, uh, try to make you, well, think, I mean, you think, you, we are thinking, we are the, the whole day thinking, but maybe think about these issues, make you reflect and make you change your habits, or see if we should change your habits, maybe you don't, maybe you are the perfect teacher and then you know what to do in every single situation, which is absolutely difficult because of the complex situations that we face every day. When we teach, especially in primary education, we find people who cannot tell you properly what happens in their minds, in their hearts. And when we teach in secondary education, you find people who don't want to tell you what happens in their minds and in their hearts. So it's always a hard work for us. Sometimes when we talk to families, we find people who don't want to tell you the reality of what happens in the, uh, at home, or they will tell you or they will bring you different expectations from those that you have uh, at school. So it's pretty difficult. But the thing is that we, as teachers, should always be thinking and reflecting and keep on working on the things that we do. I mean, it is not a matter of coming here. When, when I talk to you here, I'm talking, and you have to know this, I'm talking to people who are really interested in keep on learning and keep on working. So you have to, as Frank Sinatra says, you have to spread the news. And you have to go back to your schools and bring the things that you are learning here today. These of the mindfulness, these of the the use of subtitles and other things that you have been learning these days, is what you have to go now and bring these new ideas. And not to be shy. I mean, you shouldn't be shy doing these things. You come here, you do the effort of spending one week here, and you are learning, sharing experiences with others, and now it's your time to exchange this and bring these ideas to others. 
Well, if I ask you this, you will all say yes. I mean, do you include? Who says no? So we have two options. If we say yes, we will click there in the blue thin, and if we click in the red thin, it means that we don't care. Let's see what happens. So if we click no, you can go now and have a nice day in Cuenca and enjoy the city and uh, see the monuments and all these things. But I know that you will stay here because you include. I mean, you bring inclusion to your lessons. And if you do, well, you sign up for a bombing, as they say there, the apunta on bombardeo, because you do anything that comes to your school. I mean, if there is clear, clear. If there is a, a Escuela Espacio de Paz, you do a Escuela Espacio de Paz. If there is any, any other plans that for the school, you are there. If there are any activities that go out of the school, you are there. So you are not all the teachers that we have. And then you have to spread the news, as I told you before. So you will, I mean, we love you because you do these things. You include kids, which is good, which is excellent. You care about the possibilities and you love teaching. If you do those things, we love you. I mean, the system loves you. Families will love you. You will be happy with your teaching if you do that. If you take care of the expectations of students, your pupils, and of families, and of your other colleagues at school, which is not always easy to work with. And then, let's see the background. And why are you a stat picture over there? But the background is that sometimes I find people who say these of well, it's uh, not many students with special situations in our classrooms. And they say that especially when they prepare, and I prepare people for the competitive exams now for 13, 14 years. And when we come to the section of diversity, they say, well, in this school, in this setting that I prepared, I didn't bring any special situations, which is not real. I mean, we have many different real situations there. And then we have to face those. The thing is that there we will say how we have these special situations, we have to face those special situations, and we have to know what to do with them. We will see some special cases today, and I will ask you what to do in those uh, situations, and you will tell me. Because then sometimes, and as I told you before, it is not a matter of you yourself. I mean, it's not that I'm going to change the, the system, I'm going to change my school. It is a school. If you don't have the support of the school, if you don't have the head teacher there supporting you, or doing things, you will feel alone, and maybe you stop doing things, which is the most terrible thing that could happen in our job. So we have to try to spread again these things, bring all the people to these uh, training courses, and try to change their minds. The research on this topic. What about the research? I mean, research is not a matter of scientists. I mean, I don't need to be in a, in a lab to do research. I mean, we do research at the university. And research on what? Well, you can do research on the different degrees of the adverb. Nice. Adjuncts, disjuncts, subjuncts, and conjuncts. Very nice. I don't know how useful it is, but people do research on that. But maybe we have to do research on this, and by now, we don't have much research on how to deal with diversity in the clear context. Bilingual and clear, we will see if it is the same or not. And the question here is that clear should be for everyone. You should tell me, I mean, you are all from uh, primary education? Any from secondary? No. Okay. Uh, Andalusia. We have people from Andalusia? Please, put your hands up. Okay, Madrid? Good. Okay, now we have people from Madrid now. Ready for an answer or? Ready for an answer? Madrid. And now, in Madrid, is there any restrictions to be in a bilingual school or can anyone come to a bilingual school in Madrid? Okay, you can tell me in Spanish, no problems. Oh, this is bilingual, so we can use both languages. And then, if you are, say, if you are there, uh, any kid in Madrid could come to a bilingual school, or do you have to? Do you need any uh, special requirements to attend a bilingual school? Is it that anyone can go? Okay, anyone. And then, when they, they come to this school, they have to. Do the whole thing in English or only part of the subjects in English? Okay, and will it depend on where you live? 
So you depend, it depends on the options that you want to take. Okay. It's not the same in Andalusia. In Andalusia, you have bilingual schools. Now we have uh, uh, semi-private schools also in the bilingual sections. And uh, you go there and they all have the same opportunities. But it will depend on the school where you go that you will have 100% the of the curriculum in English or less, or it will depend on how the school has organized this uh, teaching. But it's different. What I mean here is that clearly should be for everyone. And when I say everyone, I mean any different situations we could face at school. I mean, when you open the school and you find people who have a lower level, economic level, or people who have a higher level, or people who go to private academies, or people who do not go and cannot go to any of the special activities that you prepare to take the kids to England or any of these other activities. So that's the thing that we have to face. We have to give these options to anyone. I have a student from uh, Ivory Coast, and uh, he spoke Spanish, he speaks Spanish uh, perfectly. And when I asked him why he studied Spanish, he said, well, it was a kind of lottery, and then odd and evens, and then odds, we studied uh, French, and uh, we studied Spanish, sorry, and evens, they studied French. And that's it. At the beginning in Andalusia, it was a lottery. And then some of the students came to the bilingual schools and some others didn't. Then the organization put them in and out of the system, which is not fair. Which is not fair. Because if not, we will do this for the elite. And that is not good. I mean, we have to give the same opportunities to all of them, especially if they need this special uh, care. And now parents. Poof, parents. Are you parents? Yeah. yeah. So you are parents, and then you know very well what I mean. Your son, your daughter is the most beautiful, is the very clever, is so intelligent. She never says anything. She... And then you teachers have to talk to people who think that their kids are so good and they do. Well, what happens with this of the bilingualism? With parents. You have to help parents. I mean, parents need your support. And then you have to give support to the kids, to the uh, school, to the parents, to the inspection, to anyone. You are the, the caregiver. But you have to. Why? Because now if you're going to send any homeworks, maybe they cannot help them with the homeworks. And we will see how to do that. We will say, okay, we'll give you options, and then you decide. But that is the thing. I mean, if I'm the father of a son who is 10 years old and he's studying in German, and I cannot help him, I have a problem. Because maybe he doesn't want to do what he's supposed to do. And then me, as a teacher, now not as a father, as a teacher, have to give the options, the tools, to help him at uh, home. If I don't do this, I can have these differences that I don't like. Those students who can, can pay private academies, and they go and they have extra lessons in English, or they are, get help in their homework and these things, or I can find these others that do not have that. So I have to see, and I have also to think of what parents can think on these things. And nowadays, I mean, you must be tired of the definitions, but I want to see what this guy, who knows a lot about CLIL, of course, said and how inclusion was or was not included in this definition. He means that CLIL refers to situations where subjects, no people, subjects, asignaturas, parts or subjects are taught through a foreign language with dual focus aims, namely the learning of content and simultaneous learning of a foreign language. So that's for everyone. That is for everyone. Here we are a mixed ability group. Some of you speak English very well, some others have a B2, another one with a C1, another one with a C2, another one with a very good level but no uh, Trinity or Cambridge uh, certificates. So this is a mixed ability class with people who are really interested. When you come to a primary lesson, you have to add something to this definition. The second one is like uh, six years after, and now he says that this approach involves learning subjects such as his history, geography, or others through an additional language. It can be very successful in enhancing the learning of languages and other subjects, and developing in the youngsters, and that is youngsters in general, a positive can-do attitude. Youngsters, I mean, we don't teach youngsters. We need to know that we are going to face different situations, very different situations, in different contexts. For example, who of you are from Catalonia? Or Valencia, you, okay? Okay, so when I say bilingualism, that has a different meaning for them. They are bilingual. They are bilingual. When we teach in a bilingual setting, it's different than when you teach in a monolingual setting. And you have to know that, and you have to face that, and not to feel frustrated, because your kids will not be bilingual. They will do a bilingual use of learning. You will be using two languages. That's nice. That's good. 
but maybe CLIL should be used instead of this of uh, bilingualism in those special contexts. Here we have uh, examples of people who come from uh, the Basque Country or Catalonia in which they have a bilingual teaching, and then we have a third language or an additional language as they are called now. Well, what else do we have? Well, this of CLIL has people who love this of CLIL, and they are absolutely uh, enthusiastic, I am. And they say, for example, my colleague La Saga Baster says that it has extremely positive effects on affective factors. Why? Because you feel much better when you speak a different language, when you understand other people, when you have more options to play uh, video games, for example. That's it. But we also have this study from Secular Leno that says that it affects less positively on people's content learning and general school performance. That my question is, do you think that bilingual teaching affects the level of contents of your students? Do they learn less of the contents that they are supposed to learn in Spanish or the same? Less, okay, who says less, please? Hands up. Who says the same? You see? Okay? And then we will say why this happens. Why this happens? Well, maybe because we have, we are following a textbook. And with this coursework, we are obliged to give six different sessions, lessons, sorry. And then we have to give the, the units of work that appear in, the, in this. And this is a, an adaptation of the contents in Spanish. Or it is, and you can check that, you as teachers, we'll check that the level of English of your students in the English subject is different from the level of English that they have in the texts, in the bilingual textbooks. Absolutely. It is not Krashen's theory of input plus one. It is input plus 10. Because they have passive voice, they have relative clauses, they have vocabulary that is really tough, and they have things. I mean, I have a son who is 10 years old, and sometimes I have to go and look up the meaning of the dictionary of some words. Because I don't know how to say las capas de la tierra in, in uh, and I don't care about that, really. Because it is not a thing that I have to do daily. But it is something that, if I cannot do that, let's see what they are going to do. And recycling that information is going to be also really positive. Let's see. Some misunderstandings. Which misunderstandings do you think we face when we talk about uh, CLIL and diversity and bilingualism? For example, number one, that our students will be bilingual when they finish primary education. Any others? No? Let's see. Here are some of them. Content is not the final aim, but putting them in yours. Well, content is not the final aim. Why? We're going to work with different learning styles. Some kids will learn the list of vocabulary, or will learn the vocabulary that they are supposed to learn, not the list, but the, the vocabulary that they are studying in a unit of work. And they will forget that, like this. Because they don't practice that when they leave the school. They will not talk about the parts of their flowers when they leave school. They don't go home and they say, oh, look at the flower, and they talk about flowers. And so they will not learn that. Put them in use is different. I mean, if we start working with these functions of the language, and we give them the options of putting this in use, that's going to be different. Because they will have the options of putting that in action. And they will have to work on that with other colleagues. And then, the more you use a word, the better you learn that. If not attrition, the terrible word is all. Attrition will appear. That's one of the misunderstandings that we can face here. But clearly it's not learning a list of words. Attrition, as I said before, is the second one. Number three is this of diversity, inclusion, and differentiation are only or terms that could only be used with disabled students, which is not. It's not true. I mean, when I say diversity, when we talk about diversity, we mean different situations in the classroom that could bring these students that are stronger or weaker, more advanced, less advanced. I mean, you know very well, those that people call fast finishers that I don't like at all because they finish whatever you give them, or those slow learners that I hate because I don't, I don't want any kids to be called slow, a slow learner. So these things that you face every single day are things that could be dealt and uh, got when dealing with diversity. And that bilingualism is, uh, is clear or clear is bilingualism. I think that what we do is clear and that's it. The bilingualism could need a bilingual context. 
And then CLIL maybe could be the best option to name this. And could be, as we have TIC schools, ICT schools, we should have CLIL schools. And maybe we go better for the uh, name that we should give to, to this situation. And here, one sentence, just for thinking. If we don't clear our misunderstandings, they'll be the seat of our frustration. And that's it. I think that's it. I mean, that's why I wrote that. Because if we don't see clearly what we can do and the expectations that we create in families and kids, it's going to be, or could be, really difficult. More misunderstandings. That clearly is only for stronger and more advanced learners. And people keep on thinking that. Especially parents. And that is absolutely bad for society, for the system, for us as teachers. I mean, we have to give the options to all the kids, and that's hard work. And we have to know how to do that. And it is hard work. Why do you think that parents think that? Okay, that the students cannot manage the content and that they will not get the content, you say. So you think that they are really concerned? Uh, we got low expectative about what the kids can do. They, they think that they can, it's the parents idea they think my kids cannot do this. Because they got this difficulty, this difficulty, and this difficulty. They, so they could be... They could be aware of the difficulties of teaching in a foreign language, of working with this foreign language. And one of the questions is, why do we need this? Like, why do we need to study all these things in English if they are not going to be teachers of English or going to England or whatever? I mean, we have many millions of students, and then we have many millions of different situations there, and families thinking different things about all these things. But you have to face all these things. I mean, you are the teachers, and you have no other option. Solution could be bringing native teachers or teachers with a C2 level. That's it. That's the solution for the problem. How many times have you heard this? Now Junta Andalucía is going to ask for a C1 level, which is good. It's good. We need a C1 level, but we need teachers. We need teachers. Before a C1. That's right. So you can have a C1, a C2, or you can have a B4. But you need, that's right, I mean, you need to, to, to be a teacher. Then if you put all the things together, if you put a person who really loves and cares about what he or she is doing, and then with a good level of English, that's going to work. But it's not a solution to bring people. I mean, when we have the, the language assistance, which is good, it's absolutely good, but they are not teachers. Most of them are studying, I don't know, computer science or uh, business or whatever, and that is not the, the thing. So they can help, but they are not really teachers, and they are not really involved in, in teaching. But you will always listen that the problem, the solution for the problem is there to have a C1 or C2 or whatever. Make good help, but it's not the solution to it. It's teachers that are properly trained. Course books translated into English is the solution, and uh, that we are innovators because we teach social science and physical education, all of these things in English. And, uh, well, we are, I mean, we are innovating, we are working on something new, but we are doing what we are supposed to do. So, innovating could be that I'm going to work hard on how to do this, and how to make this feasible, and how to make this um, successful, in terms of kids, uh, in terms of the expectations of parents, and, of course, your own expectations as a teacher. I mean, we don't want frustrated teachers. We don't want teachers who have these high expectations with students who don't have the support at home or maybe at schools where you don't have the support from uh, head teachers. And now, we cannot forget to get on their parents' shoes and we will understand how hard we have to work. I mean, always, always. You always have to understand that and we always have to think of things like this. I mean, we have parents there and it is really hard for a father and mother to understand the low level of his or her son or daughter in any of the subjects. So it's good to bear in mind that uh, Parents will be always really concerned with what happens in the classroom. <clears throat> well, inclusion, the term inclusion is uh, key and is, is key in any of the things that we do concerning uh, education. More, especially for those who are, I was trying to find the translation for the term bianquera. 
and I talked to a colleague and we were saying uh, over polite could be over polite for the encare so those who include but do not include or those who teach but do not or those who say that they cooperate with the people in Africa and they do not I mean that's it so here we have this example of uh, in some terms. Inclusion. Well, here we have that. Calambuca works with 26 inclusive studies on bilingual contexts. And 80% of the studies indicate that integrating special needs into mainstream schools does not have a negative influence on other pupils, which is excellent. So see, the big percentage is 80%. It doesn't have negative effects having these kids there. So those of you who listen to people saying that these kids should not be part of the bilingual section or should not be part of the, I mean, that is not good. That is not fair. And that is proof that it works. So they, they, we don't have much research, but the research is really good. Moberg says that only, and say, 5% of class teachers, subject teachers, special needs teachers, and principals supported inclusion to some extent. So how can we see that? I mean, see, the people really interested in this, head teachers, the coordinators of the bilingual sections and so on, principals, they supported inclusion only in the 5%. Why do you think that happens? Why do you think that this could happen? I mean, people who are really on stage, people who are really working daily with these uh, kids in a special situation. Well, the reason is that they feel fear of not being able to provide quality teaching for both pupils with and without special needs. So, we can now call and say that we need more in-service training. Pre-service training and in-service training. Training at the university doesn't cover these situations at all. It doesn't cover. I mean, I teach at the university and I train teachers, and it doesn't cover that, number one. Number two, the training that you get, the FEP and all these uh, institutions where you go, first of all, only some of you go, most of you. But the rest of the people who should go, do not go. And they should go. They should be brought. And if they don't come, they should be fired. And that's it. Is it? Is it? It is not that you got a position as a teacher for the rest of your life. No. You are going to get that position. And that's good. You can keep that position. But you have to keep on working on that. And feeling that you are part of the system. And this system needs teachers that are really involved in these things. If not, we have that. We have no training, pre-service training at the university, and we don't have many options when you have in-service training. After that, you have to combine this in-service training with your family, with extra hours, with the evening sessions, or who knows what, how, how to do that. So it is really hard and really tough reading that when you see that these people are not against the inclusion in these sections. They are feeling that they are not prepared to face that correctly, which is sad. It is sad for politicians that do not care about that, and it is sad about those at universities who prepare their system. I think that that cannot be read properly. And uh, well, this is the, the report, the Euridice, from 2006, and talks about uh, diversity and all these things. And then, then I was trying to find the meaning that they give to diversity in these terms. I mean, this is a European thing, and it is a, a report that they uh, provide every year and it is absolutely good. And when I try to find the meaning of diversity, diversity appeared only as a cultural diversity. But not diversity in the classroom. Not diversity in what we do or what we say or how we have to face teaching in any context in Europe. They only talk about diversity in a general sense, it's saying that diversity is going to be, well, uh, we have people from different countries, people from different uh, nationalities, which is good, but not all the terms. And now, the word inclusion appears nine times, meaning the inclusion of languages in the curriculum. Nothing else. Not inclusion of kids or inclusion of all the fans. The word diversity appears again nine poor times, and it means the linguistic diversity. Differentiation does not appear. Does not appear. Or underachievers, gifted, stronger, weaker, more or less advanced, do not appear either. And there is a report about teaching in Europe. And this should be uh, controlled. And see from the European Union how we face these situations in different contexts. But they do not. And that is sad. Well, the official documents. Let's see what we say in Andalusia. 
And uh, it is to say that. It is to say this of Kill Me Lori. Matame Camion. Because we, when you, when you come to the official documents and you see what or how they face these situations, you can see things like this. In the instructions, the instructions that establish the guidelines to proceed with special educational needs, in Andalusia, they mention this of uh, diversity in general terms. And they mean, and they work really hard on how to deal with diversity, how to cope with diversity, which is good. But they don't mention anything of how to do that in bilingual contexts. What to do with the different levels, for example, or different uh, backgrounds, or different uh, attitudes of families, or how to manage with uh, ICTs, for example, and these kids. They don't mention anything. So they're going to leave us uh, bad. Madrid. Well, in Madrid, we have that a B1 level is required to be accepted in a secondary bilingual school. This is sad. It's a B1 level. And especially a B1 level given by, I don't know, but in Andalusia, you will have to go through the Escuela Oficial de Idiomas if you want, but only 50 people every year in that in Granada. So people have to go to private academies and then pay taxes for Cambridge or Trinity. And then when you go to those... Uh, uh, certificates, you come to the concurso de traslados, you cannot use that. It is nonsense. But it is that they give you the chance, they give you the, the responsibility of working with these situations, but they don't give you the solutions. They don't offer solutions in those things. Let's see what happens in all the communities. For example, Murcia. And we're going to give them a big applause because they say that teachers involved in bilingual teaching must establish methodological and evaluation strategies to cope with diversity in the bilingual classroom. So I felt so happy. I want to go to Murcia now. And now they say also that the teaching staff may recommend not to study subjects in English to these kids. Why not? I mean, if we have to use Spanish, we use Spanish. Why not? I mean, if we see that he or she cannot follow, cannot attend these subjects in English, that's it. That's it. I mean, we come to an agreement with the family. We can, if we come to this agreement with the family, the school, with any of the... Uh, elements in the, in the teaching process, we will be happy to take uh, these decisions. But let's see. They make a list of recommendations, and this is a task that I'm going to ask you, to follow primary teachers or how to teach content to primary teachers in, uh, in a bilingual setting. So they're going to, this is like for the opposition, for the competitive exams, this section of methodology. And then you have beautiful ideas. And then I will ask you to develop these ideas, okay? So you now will have to work. I don't know how you work. You work in groups or how do you do? In groups? Okay. So with your group, it's only a matter of five minutes, ten minutes. You have to think of, or even less, the recommendations. Now you are el consejero, la consejera de educación y Murcia. Are you going to say, okay, now you teachers, we have to do this because I'm an expert this. And I'm going to tell you what you have to do. For example, you will have to, and you cannot use this, use the communicative uh, language teaching approach. Okay? I don't like that. So that's why I gave you this as an example. But you have to give me real things. Things that you as a teacher read and say, okay, this works. This really works. Okay? Five is good enough for primary education. I will give you five for primary and five for secondary education and we will see if this really works or not. Okay? So please, proceed. Five minutes, no more, to give five guidelines of how to work on bilingual settings.
This is a kind reminder. A kind reminder to tell you that you have to give, you have to give suggestions of how to work in the classroom with these kids in a bilingual setting. Okay? Not a C1 level. I mean, you're not politicians. You're going to tell the teachers how to do. You have to, well, let's pretend that we're talking to a colleague, having a coffee, and this colleague tells you that he or she is really concerned because he doesn't know how to proceed in the classroom. Then you tell them, okay, I will give you five key ideas or five suggestions or five methodological approaches that I will recommend to you. So if you say, for example, work with tasks, make them participate in tasks, okay? So that's one. Not, uh, or use English, someone said, use more English or, I mean, you have to give the ideas and I will ask you how to proceed, okay? But it's not that you're not, you're not politicians and we don't want to be politicians by now. <laughs>